Well, it is a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, Smed is actually preaching at a missions conference uh, this weekend in Florida, so we get to share him with another church. And uh, I have an opportunity to be with you for the next two weeks to go through Ephesians chapter 1. So if you would turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. So my wife and I are not pet people, or at least I'm, I'm not a pet person, and my wife is kind to me. Uh, we don't have dogs, don't have cats. I just don't really, uh, just don't really enjoy uh, the thought of having a pet. But about a month ago, we got a pet. We were at a small group, and uh, my daughter came up to me at a small group and said, Dad, can we take home a fish? I said, uh, you, you know, usually it's, can, can I have a cookie to take home in the car? You know, not a, not a fish. And uh, we ended up getting this fish. Uh, we get instructions for the fish. Here, here's what you must do to keep this fish alive. You have to feed it maybe once a day. You have to change its water every couple weeks. Keep the tank clean. And that's, that's pretty much it. About as easy of a pet as you could have. So we, we took the fish home. Uh, it's still alive. It's a, a thriving fish. And, uh, and, it, and it's pretty easy. It's a, it's a good pet. That's about where I'll stop for pets. Uh, but but we, can, we can start to imagine the, the Christian life is like, is like caring for this fish. There are a couple uh, check boxes that I, have to, that I have to do. If I just do this once a day, if I do this once a week, then I can press on toward maturity. And we find out that Christian life is, is not like that. It's not, it's not a series of, of checklists that we can do. But there are some things that, that we must prioritize in the Christian life. There are some priorities, some life priorities that we must go after as we pursue maturity in the Christian life. So we're going to look at this morning some priorities of life. It's not as simple as, as, uh, as taking care of a fish, but there are some basic things. If you zoom up just big picture, what are the things that we must go after as Christians? What, was, what must we do to pursue the Lord, to grow in maturity? So we're going to look at this in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and if you're familiar with Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, Paul lays out these great gospel realities. He says in verses 3 through 14, he gives us the behind the scenes of, of what God has done in the gospel, that, that before time began, before there was time, in God's sovereign decree, he predestined people for salvation. And in time, he sent his son who died on a cross to, to reconcile sinners to himself, and then the Holy Spirit came to those sinners when they heard the gospel and made them alive. So he gives us these great gospel truths in the first 14 verses. And then in verse 15, we get to Paul's prayer for the church. He's going to pray for this church in light of these great gospel truths. Let me pray for you. And we're going to take note of what Paul prays for, the, the kind of things that we should go after, the kind of things that we should prioritize. So if you'd read with me, we're going to read... Ephesians 1, verses 15. I'll read through 23. We're going to look at verses 15 through 19 this week and verses 20 through 23 next week. So Ephesians 1, verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul here writes this book, uh, Ephesians, he writes back to the church the believers who are in Ephesus, a city where he spent three years ministering. He preached the gospel in this city. It says the whole region heard about the gospel, heard God's word from Paul's preaching. And then he leaves Ephesus. 
And now he's writing back maybe six or seven years later, probably in prison in Rome, writing back to this church to encourage them, uh, gives them really a, a theology for Christian living. And you get to verse 15, and Paul, Paul tells these believers that he's been praying for them, that he is so encouraged by them. He has heard reports about this church over these last six and seven years. He's, he's heard reports. People have told him how it's going in Ephesus. So he wants to share with these believers how thankful he is and, and tell them how he's praying for them. So we could make some observations here about God glorifying prayer. Paul, Paul does demonstrate for us what it looks like to, to pray in a God glorifying way. But we're going to look at the, the things that Paul emphasizes in the prayer that are going to tell us the, the, the things that we should prioritize. It's like if a mom tells, tells her son on the way to school, hey, Johnny, I'm praying that you would be self-controlled at school today. Well, Johnny should walk away from that thinking, I should be self-controlled at school today. So in, in the same way, we're going to see what, what Paul prays for. When he says, I pray this for you, we should walk away and say, oh, these are the things we should go after. These things are important. We should prioritize these things. And before he begins the prayer here, Paul says that, that he is encouraged in verse 15. He has heard, having heard, he said, of the faith, of your faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So Paul's prayer here is fueled by his knowledge of how they're doing. He is encouraged. He's not writing to redirect them, to admonish them. He, he is writing to encourage them. He's been gone for six or seven years, and, and now he gets this report, this exciting report. And imagine if, if you had not been with someone for six or seven years, what would be the things that you would look for? What would be the evidences that the gospel had taken root in a life? Well, he tells us right here, these are the evidences. This is how he knows the gospel has taken root in this community. In verse 15, because it's reported, he has heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. This is where it starts. This is the, the foundation for Christian living. So we're going to look at here the three patterns of life for the maturing Christian. Three patterns of life for the maturing Christian. And it starts here with the, the fundamentals. No, number one, the maturing Christian models the Christian basics. Models the Christian basics. Faith and love. You see here in verse 15. Before Paul, Paul prays for them and tells them, here's what you should press on for, he's going to say, you are doing so well at, at Christianity 101, faith and love. These are not something that you outgrow. The Christian life is not a, a series of checkpoints or, or levels that we reach. It is a vibrant relationship with Christ and love for others throughout the Christian life. You don't, you don't graduate from those things. I was thinking about uh, English in high school. You learn about, about punctuation, you learn about grammar, you learn about periods and capital letters. You don't move on and graduate from those things. Oh, good, now I don't have to capitalize anymore. You know, now I'm in college, I don't have to use proper English, I don't have to use commas. No, you, you have to use those foundational elements. You don't move past those things. The growth in maturity doesn't sidestep the fundamentals. Just pure devotion to Christ. This is a Christianity 101. Faith in the Lord Jesus, love for God's people. And these believers in Ephesus, they have genuine faith. Faith in Jesus. They are trusting him for their eternity. They are entrusting their souls to him. And it says faith in the Lord Jesus. This is Jesus the master, Jesus the king. They have submitted to Jesus. If you were going to ask, what is a Christian? How would you define a Christian? Just, just basically, well, do you see Jesus as the, the Savior of your soul? And is he the Lord of your life? Is he the Savior of your soul and the Lord of your life? That's what it means to be a Christian. You've entrusted your soul to Christ, his death in your place. And you have submitted to him. You have humbled yourself under him. So they have a genuine faith in the Lord. Jesus is Lord of their life. There, there's no category for a believer, a believer in Christ, who, who does not submit to him as Lord. That doesn't exist in the New Testament. And as we think about faith, I think it's helpful to think of it in, in three different aspects. You think about knowledge. You know truth 
about God. You know truth about Jesus. You know that he lived, that he died. Uh, Secondly, you believe those truths. Not just, okay, they're out here, but yeah, I believe that truth. I believe that Jesus died. And, And then thirdly, you trust that truth or you entrust yourself to that truth. I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. That is my only hope in this life and the life to come. That is faith. Banking my life on these things. And this is the the pattern of the Christian life. The the Christian life is a life of faith. From from day one, until Christ returns, or until you die, you have faith. You you believe in what you don't see. We don't move past that. That's a, a fundamental, fundamental Christianity. Trust God. And he says he has heard of their love, their love for all the saints. Our culture talks a lot about love. We talk about love as if it's some kind of warm feeling, uh, this fuzzy emotion that I feel for somebody else. Well, biblical love is not an emotional feeling. It is something demonstrated. It is sacrificial. You could define love as an affectionate concern for another, leading you to give of yourself for their good. It's being more concerned with another's good over and above your own. To, to love another is to desire the best for that person. You know, so many people in, you hear in dating relationships say, I love this person because of how they make me feel. I love them because they make me feel a certain way. And, and you hear that, and there's something wrong with that picture, because what you're saying effectively is, I love to feel a certain way, and that person helps me get there. They help me feel how I want to feel. Well, that's not biblical love. That's, that's self-love. Biblical love is sacrifice for others. Laying aside, my own, laying aside my own desires for the sake of another. So Paul here is hearing this report of this church's love. He, he often in Acts will send his traveling companions to check on the churches to see how they're doing. Or maybe he's hearing reports from travelers who have gone through Ephesus. And all of them are saying, have you heard about the Ephesians? Have you heard about their faith and their love? Have you heard about the love that they have for each other? That church is different. Those people are different. They love one another. It was evident for people to see. And maybe you've had this experience where you travel somewhere else. You go to a different church in a different state, and you meet with like-minded Christians. And on day one, you just have this this connection. Oh, these are my people. We, We love the same things. We speak the same. We have genuine love. You can see it. It's evident just in a, in a few conversations. We had this experience recently with the, the Twombly's. If you haven't met Brian and Kara Twombly, they're here for another couple of weeks. They're training uh, to be missionaries in Papua New Guinea. They're with our church for a couple of months training, and then they're going to be sent out, I think in March is the plan. And just meeting them, uh, like-minded believers, they love the same truths. They love the church. They love God's people. And just on day one, like, oh man, these are our people. And just, just one story that I think highlights that. I uh, was hanging out. Brian was at, at my house. And uh, my wife, was, Ashley, was out. And she was uh, coming back home. And Brian says, hey, we should probably, uh, should, we, should we clean the dishes? Should we uh, clean up the kitchen? That would probably bust your wife, right, if she came home to a clean kitchen. And I'm, you know, sitting on the couch drinking coffee. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm glad you thought of that first, you know. And... Uh, but here's a guy that he just met my wife that week, and he just wants to pour himself out in love. Oh, man, I just love to serve your wife that way. I love to serve you guys that way. That's, that's Christian love. It's obvious. That's what's going on in this passage. Other Christians have traveled to Ephesus, and they report back to Paul. These people love each other. Now, wives, think about, when could you say that you experience your husband's love the most? When do you experience that? Well, it usually involves service usually involves when he's caring for you, taking an interest in you, working hard to to do what's best for you, sacrificing behind the scenes. Now think for a minute, how would people know that a church loves one another? How would an outside person coming in say, I know this church loves each other? Well, you could think about different, different manifestations of that love, caring for each other's needs, serving sacrificially, taking care of one another, discipleship even in the church. That would demonstrate love. People speaking truth to one another. They're they're involved in each other's lives. They're showing hospitality, watching kids, making meals. You wouldn't say that church, they really love each other because they gather for an hour and a half on a Sunday, and that's it. That's the only time they see each other. 
You, you wouldn't say that. You can only say that if, if they were in each other's lives. It was obvious. They're connected. They're showing hospitality. They're meeting needs. They have warm affection for each other. People should walk into this church and say, wow, you all love each other. It's obvious how much you love each other. And, and Ashley and I have experienced that so much in this church. It has been a joy to just experience Christian love. I remember our first, first or second Sunday here, and I don't think I've ever told her this story, but Kim Maxwell came up to us on our, our second, maybe first Sunday, and uh, started asking us all these questions. And uh, we got in the car afterward, and we both looked at each other, and we're like, man, these people are intense. And they asked these uh, soul-piercing questions. And uh, looking back on, that, on those moments, though, I just, we experienced Christian love, someone that took a genuine interest in us, people that wanted to come alongside us. That is, that is Christianity 101, loving each other, loving the saints. So as you consider the believers in Ephesus that were marked by these things, you could ask yourself the, this question, do, do I demonstrate those things? Could people look in at my life? Would they see a life that's characterized by faith in Christ and love for God's people? People I work with, people I go to school with, neighbors, do, do they look at my life and see those things? Is that characteristic of my life? This is where Paul starts the, the basics of Christianity, faith and love. We don't graduate from those things. You, you must have those things down. This is where, where Paul starts. This is where the encouragement starts. And he moves past the, the basics. Here's my encouragement toward you, church. And then he's going to go into his prayer. So we'll actually look at the prayer itself, the content of Paul's prayer. And that's going to give us really the, the perspective to say, okay, what are the things now? We're, we're, we're in the basics, faith and love. Now, what are the things we should prioritize? What are the patterns of life? that Paul is praying for them. And now the, the meat of the prayer here. Here's the, you know, the, the fish food, the, the clean water. Here's the things that you must do to, to be healthy, to be maturing. Uh, number two here, looking at verse 17, would be to pursue God's truth. The, the mature Christian pursues God's truth. We're going to see this in verse 17. Paul says, so verse 16, he says, he does not give, cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And now he's going to give us the content. Here's, here's what he prays for. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. So he starts this request first by acknowledging God's glory. Acknowledging that God is the giver of these things. Before the request even just to acknowledge that, that God gives any of these things, any Christian maturity, Christian life, it, it comes from God. He is the giver. Again, this is a life of faith. We are dependent on the Lord for any of these things. And he says the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And someone could read this and say, well, what does that mean? Is he saying that Jesus isn't God? Well, obviously not. He, he's saying this is the, the true God, the God that Jesus made known. Amongst all the false gods in this pagan city, the, the true God, the, the God that was revealed through his son, the God who came in flesh, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, he prays to this God, prays that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the word spirit here, you could think of this Someone might say, hey, is that the Holy Spirit? Is he, is he praying that God would give them the Holy Spirit? Well, in verse 13, he already said that they have the, the Spirit. The Spirit has been given. When they believe, they have the Holy Spirit. He is a pledge of their inheritance. So here he's not, again, praying for the Spirit whom they already possess, who's already with them. He's using Spirit here really as, a, as an adjective, you could say, to describe what kind of revelation, what kind of wisdom, spiritual wisdom, a certain kind of wisdom and revelation in the spiritual realm, the kind of wisdom and revelation that would, that would equip your soul, your spirit. Wisdom, this would be insight into the things of God. A revelation, this is God's revealed will, uh, mysteries that God has revealed to us. These are spiritual matters that God has revealed. <clears throat> to, to summarize, wisdom and revelation, this is God's truth, biblical truth. 
So Paul is praying that they would have a growing confidence and clarity in biblical truth, that they would pursue biblical truth. And he says that you would pursue this wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. I think the him there is Jesus specifically. But in the knowledge of him, you you could read this as to say aimed at knowing him with the goal, with the outcome of knowing him. Or or to put it this way, I I pray that you would have a, a desire for wisdom and revelation resulting in knowing God. This is what Jesus says in John 17, 3. uh, Eternal life is this, that that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the goal here of of knowing God's wisdom, to to know Christ. He's saying, I pray that you would have a zeal for the truth with the goal, with an outcome of knowing Christ. That's the goal. Know God's word so that you would know God. Be eager, he's saying. Be eager to pursue God's wisdom so that you can know the God who gave that wisdom. Know your Bible so you can know Christ. For for someone progressing into Christian maturity, for the maturing believer, it only comes through through a knowledge of God's truth. There's no other way toward maturity. It has to come through, through the doorway of truth. You can't trust the Lord if you don't know his character. So you grow in knowledge of God through his word, through what he's revealed about himself. So we find that reading our Bible is not an academic exercise, but it is part of a a vibrant relationship with God. And again, when he says wisdom and revelation, he's talking about biblical clarity, that you would have clarity about the things God has revealed, the truths that you have in front of you, that they would be clear in your mind, that you would understand them you would have a more accurate, more complete knowledge of God. This is why Paul in 1 Timothy 3 says that the the qualification of a pastor, one of the qualifications is to be able to teach. You you could define ability to teach as as having biblical clarity. Someone who has applied the truth to their own lives and they're able to communicate it to others. It's clear in their mind. I want to make it clear now in your mind. This is what the church needs. This is what a pastor is doing. And this is what each Christian is responsible for, to have biblical clarity, to grow in this, to know what God says, so that you can know the Lord. So it's worth it for us to open our Bibles. It's worth it to to listen to the preaching of the word, to be here on a Sunday morning, to to be in the ministries of the church when God's word is taught, to, to read your Bible faithfully. It's worth it because you are seeking to know God. That's the goal. Just think about the the payoff of anything that has a payoff. Think about sports, uh, high school sports. I mean, you you work so hard. I was talking to someone that got a got a touchdown last week, first touchdown. And you think about all of the work going up to that. You have summer practices in the heat. You have weights. You're watching film on Saturdays, and then finally the payoff in the game. You get a touchdown. It's it's worth it. All of that work is worth it. Well, here we have the the ultimate payoff. You spend time wrestling with scripture. You spend time hearing God's word, opening your Bible. And the payoff is you get to know God. You get to grow in your relationship with the living God. That's worth it. That's that's a payoff. So Paul's prayer here is for this growing knowledge. A thriving, a maturing Christian is not stagnant. They're not complacent, not satisfied with yesterday's growth. There's no uh, check the box mentality. So again, Paul here prays that they would have a zeal, a a desire, a pursuit for knowing the Lord through his word as a pattern for their life. The pattern here is pursuing biblical truth. And then Paul is going to get into some specific truths. Here are specific truths you must embrace. Verse 18 and 19, he's going to tell us, here are the specific truths I want you to go after. Here's the the truths that are going to fortify you. And that's going to bring us to the the third pattern of life here for the maturing Christian. Third pattern of life. The mature Christian builds unwavering conviction. Builds unwavering convictions.
He says here, I pray, verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And really, this is a continuation of the previous verse. You you grow in spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, which enlightens the eyes of your heart. This is biblical truth bringing light to your heart. The truth that causes you to have spiritual eyesight. It uses a metaphor here for the heart, as as if your heart has eyeballs, as if it could see. The heart, which is your control center, that drives your thoughts, your affections, your emotions. They they flow out of your heart. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says, the the mouth speaks what is in the heart. What comes out of the mouth is what's in your heart. So if your temper rises, you yell at somebody, well, well, there was anger in your heart. So the heart here, the control center of what you do, that's where truth must come. It must impact you at a desire level. So Paul here prays that this control center, your heart would have spiritual vision in the dark recesses of your heart where there's still indwelling sin, still weakness. I want that to be enlightened with the truth. Uh, A few um, years ago, I took a a fishing trip with some guys and one of the guys on this trip brought some uh, military grade night vision goggles. So these night vision goggles, you know, it's pitch black out in the, out in the forest. And you put these on and you could see, I mean, clear as day. I mean, everything. I mean, deer over here, you could see, I mean, 10 times as many stars. It was incredible, just the, the clarity that this brought, these, this, this vision, this night vision. This is what Paul is praying for, that, you, that your heart would be enlightened by this truth. That you would see clearly in a dark world. In a world full of confusion and chaos, you would see accurately. So Paul, again, is praying that the truth would resonate deep in your heart and shape your very desires. That you would have these unwavering convictions. We use the word convictions. That is to say, to be convinced of truth in your heart. Truth that would drive what you do and how you act. The convictions, you would say, I'm so convinced of these truths that they shape how I live. I have become so convinced that I live in light of what I've heard, of what I've read, of what God says here. Or I prioritize my life around these truths that I'm convinced of. It's not general here. These are specific truths. He's going to give us three specific truths that you must be convinced of. Here are the convictions you must know. So verse 18 and 19, he lays them out for us. They're pretty easy to see here. Verse 18 so that you will know, he uses this word, what, to identify them. What is the hope of your calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? And then verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power? These three things, the hope of your calling, the riches of his glory, his glorious inheritance, and the surpassing greatness of his power. So if you're taking notes, these are three, three subpoints under point three. These are the, the convictions the type of convictions that he's saying you must go after. First, middle of verse 18, what is the hope of your calling? What is the hope of your calling? You must know what is the hope of your calling. We use the word hope. You think about certainty of the future, to to be certain, to be confident about the future. That would be a simple definition of hope. He said, I want you to have a, a certainty, a confidence about your future based on what? based on your calling, based on God's effectual call of you in salvation. This word calling is used throughout the New Testament. This is God's, God's call of believers. When they were dead in sin, he lays it out for us in chapter 2. They were dead in sin, and God made them alive through Jesus Christ. This is the calling. The, the gospel comes to, to dead sinners, to helpless sinners, to those that are, that are hopeless, that have no ability to save themselves. And God calls them to life. He says, you must know these truths. You were dead. You were unable to save yourself. And God made you alive. So that's the, the first conviction, conviction here is the, the hope of your calling, or say it this way, to a certain salvation. Be convinced of, a, of your certain salvation. Have confidence in what God has done for you at the cross. Have confidence in the gospel. In the past, God brought you from spiritual death and made you alive. And now you have eternal hope. You have certainty. This is every Christian story. If you trust Christ, this is your story. You were dead and now you're alive. 
And now you have eternal hope. And whatever happens in life, whatever trials, whatever tragedy, whatever pain, whatever thing, hard thing awaits you in this life, you are part of God's family. You have a certain future. He has rescued you. Once saved, always saved, you could say. And this is an unmistakable mark of a Christian, is it not? To, to have hope, despite what life throws at you, despite the, the things, the difficulties in, in your life, to have hope of the future. You must know this. You, mu- you must have this conviction. You must live your life in light of this truth, that you have been saved by God. You have been rescued. So that's the, the first conviction he lays out here. Second part of verse 18, he says, Now, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? This is God's glorious inheritance that he shares with his people. God's people await God sharing his glorious inheritance. It's among the saints. It's in the saints. This future reward, this inheritance comes from God. It's his. It comes from him. And he shares it with his people. It's graciously given to the saints. They, they experience this. They are heirs of God's promises. The God of all glory who possesses all goodness, all power, all grace. He has an inheritance for his people. So in a world of chaos and confusion, I think even more and more we, we feel like exiles in this world. I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing for us to feel like exil- exiles and strangers and aliens in this world because we have a, a future inheritance, a sure inheritance in heaven. This is similar to what Paul says in Romans 8 when he says the, the sufferings of this present life pale in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. That to have confidence in your future glory. That you were saved in the past and now you are part of God's kingdom plans in the future. You will be co-heirs with Christ. Revelation 20 says you will reign with Christ on the earth. Not because you have some inherent worth. Not because you were so special. All, all of this highlights God's grace. It highlights his kindness. That he has purchased people. That, that we are part of God's family. This, this demonstrates God's love for his people. Christian, you are adopted into God's family. He, he has shown love to you. And in the future, he will show love to you. And if God intends to to give you a a future reward, if he loves you enough to save you, to send his son to die because of of his grace alone, what does that tell you about about today, about hard things in life today? That same love that is working on your behalf is for you today. It will be yours in the future and it is yours today. He will provide for you. He will care for you. So you must know this truth, that future glory that is coming You must be convinced of this. And then the final conviction that he gives, final conviction in verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? The surpassing greatness of his power. We're simply labeled it just as unstoppable power. You must know, you must be convinced of God's unstoppable power. This power that is for you. This all-powerful God, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the one who spoke the universe into existence, this God, Jesus, who upholds the universe by his word, that power, it says, is being wielded on behalf of God's people. Look what he says in verse 19, the greatness of his power toward us who believe, or on our behalf, his power that's working for our good. We are so weak, so frail. We have no power in in ourselves. We don't even know what tomorrow holds. We can't keep ourselves. We can't even protect ourselves on the drive home. We don't have control. Recently, we were uh, at the beach uh, with some friends. And uh, on this trip, uh, there's two two boys that were with us, uh, friends of ours, and they got sucked out into a riptide. And, uh, And we just watched 
as, as the waves are just thrashing them. And, uh, and, and the dads are, are there, can't even swim out to them because the, the waves were so strong. And I remember just standing on the beach and just, just feeling so helpless, so weak, so powerless. You know, just to see this play out and just, just in prayer, Lord, there's nothing that, that I could do here to, to help these kids. It, it has to be you. You watch the, the oceans, the waves just roar. And, and you should feel powerless. And in that moment, I, I don't think I've ever felt more powerless, more helpless. And, and God who controls the oceans, who has all power, he exercises that power on behalf of his people. That power that controls the waves. God exercises for you, Christian, on your behalf, toward you, for your good. We're going to dive more into this next week. Paul goes in to talk about this great power of God that's displayed in the the resurrection, the exaltation of Christ. But if you were going to summarize these three convictions, you could summarize it as Romans 8, 28. I think that's a summary of this. God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. These are the same, the same truths that, that Paul is saying here. He has power over all things. He works them all for good for his people. So think about these truths together now. These three truths. Uh, your certain salvation, your future glory. God's unstoppable power that is for you. You start to stack these up. God loves his children His power is for me. I have been saved. I've been rescued. What situation in life would be able to overcome that? What hardship in life would make those things untrue? In the past, God saved you. Your salvation is secure. In the future, you are part of God's family. You will dwell securely with God. There is a a reward for you, an inheritance. And in the present, today, God's power is working on your behalf. The God of all power is working for your good. And as I've, I've been uh, working at the, the church here for, for a little over a year and just being more involved in the, the life of the church, the ministry of the church, uh, just have a front row seat to see uh, just a lot of hardships in life. Uh, hardships uh, that God's people just consistently go through. There's just, there's suffering, there's trials, sickness, uh, family issues, conflict, marriage conflict, discouragement. You have pressures from the world. You have wayward children, all these hard things that come at God's people. Someone has said, you, you are either preparing for a trial or you are in the midst of a trial. And you must be convinced of these truths. As you endure the the trials of life, dig a well, bury these truths deep down so that when the drought comes, you can draw upon them. And also uh, being here in the church, have the privilege of of watching people go through trials well, watching people that that endure well, that that are faithful, that trust the Lord in the midst of trials. Just one one circumstance this this year, just getting to watch a, a seasoned couple in our church uh, just sweet friends of ours that received a, a cancer diagnosis this year. And to, to see their faith on display in the midst of, of hardship, in the midst of trials, in an unknown future. And I, in conversations, when you, when you ask this couple, are, are you scared? How are you doing? And, and they say things like, you know, this is the hardest season that we've been through. This is the hardest season that we've been through. But the, the last hardest season... <laughs> Was, was hard, and then the hardest season before that. In every hard season that we've had, God has only been faithful to us. He has only been faithful. How could we not trust him now? And they've also said things like, we aren't fearful because we have confidence in Jesus. Sure, yeah, there's moments of, 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 scare, of being scared, but we have an eternal reward. We have heaven. We aren't fearful of death. That is Christian maturity. That is a mature believer. That is someone who has lived these things out. So you think about how do you get there? How do you get to be 65 years old and and facing cancer with conviction, with strength? How do you get to a point of trials being worship to say, thank you, God. Thank you for this situation because it draws us closer to you. That's not an attitude that says we've arrived. 
That's an attitude that says we are completely dependent on Christ. That, that was true 40 years ago when we were first saved. They would say, and it is true today. So how do you get there? You, you live these truths. One day at a time, one week at a time. Your families prioritize these truths. You practice, uh, model the, the Christian basics, faith and love. You love God's people. You cling to, to Jesus in humble faith. You press on to know God's word. You press on to know God through his word. And you build these deep-rooted convictions. You convince your heart from scripture that, that you have a, a future inheritance. That you have been rescued from, from sin. You've been rescued from, from judgment. And you convince yourself that the God of all power works on your behalf for your good. That's how you're able to look back at your life when you're 70 and say, God has only been faithful to me. Would you pray with me? God, we just uh, thank you and praise you for your, your love, your grace that's on display um, in the life of this church, Lord, in the, the sinners that you have brought out of the world, out of darkness, out of, out of bondage to sin, Lord. And you have brought us into life through Jesus Christ. Lord, just to be part of your family is the, the ultimate privilege. I pray that we wouldn't move past those realities. Just a humble, sincere faith in you and a, and a devotion to each other, Lord. And I pray that if there are those here that don't yet know you, that, that our love for each other would be compelling to them, Lord. That you would convict them of their sin today. And that they would cry out to Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.